Good evening and welcome to what I think is going to be a very interesting webinar, the uh, Modern Pediatric Emergency Room or EDI Pediatric Emergency Department as it's uh, preferably called. And we have uh, four very distinguished and knowledgeable panelists who will take us through what the current Pediatric Emergency Department looks like now, what it looked like in during the pandemic and what the future will look like and some of the uh, technology that we're using to make it both safe and better for our patients coming in. And to introduce our panelists, we have Dr. John Babineau, please. Thank you, Max, and good evening, everyone. Uh, we're thrilled to be here to talk with you this evening about our emergency department, as you just heard. Um, I'd like to start off just by mentioning, um, as Max said, and John Babineau, I'm the interim chief for pediatric emergency medicine here at Columbia and at the Morgan Stanley Children's Hospital. We have with us today uh, four of my esteemed colleagues who will share with you a little bit about what we do and how patient care happens every day in our ER. It's been a fascinating year, uh, to put it mildly, and I think that um, we've learned a lot and continue to advance the field here. So in order to share that best, I'll introduce uh, folks now. Um, first uh, is Nazreen Jamal, who is our Assistant Director for Quality here in the Pediatric Emergency on pediatric emergency program, but also the uh, associate program director for our pediatric emergency fellowship, uh, which is a program that we are very proud of here um, as part of our educational portfolio. Um, next, you'll also hear from uh, Dan Fenster. Um, Dan Fenster is the assistant medical director here in our emergency department. Uh, and also serves to help lead both our simulation and telehealth programs. Lorraine Eng is here as well this evening. Um, welcome, Lorraine. She is the Assistant Director of Emergency Ultrasound here. Um, she is uh, both uh, highly lauded as a, a clinician and an emergency ultrasound educator. Um, and so we're happy to have her share uh, her thoughts about that program with all of you. Um, and then lastly, David Kessler. Uh, David is our Vice Chair for Innovation here in the Department of Emergency Medicine at Columbia and has oversight for quite a number of our programs, including things like telehealth. Uh, and I think this year we've certainly, as I mentioned, needed to uh, utilize many of those things as we made our way through this pandemic and continue to. Um, so David's leadership has been integral to helping that happen and advancing patient care by those means. So Max, uh, thank you again for having us and I'll turn it back to you and I know we have some great topics to talk about. Oh, exactly. Thank you, John. Uh, I guess I should have introduced myself. I'm uh, Dr. Max Gomez. I'm the medical correspondent uh, for CBS here in New York, CBS2. Um, and I'm a neurophysiologist, neuroscientist by training, so I, have, I know a little bit about what we're talking about today. A uh, couple of housekeeping things. If uh, as we go along, we're going to go for uh, about an hour or so till about seven o'clock uh, Eastern time here. Um, and if you have, as we go along, any questions that you want to submit, you can do so through the Q&A uh, function down at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, we are recording tonight's webinar uh, and that will be available uh, on the Columbia Children's Health channel on YouTube. And that should be up there uh, or within a day uh, or so. And I think that will do it. And what I've uh, asked our panelists, I've asked our panelists a couple of things. One is so that I'm not, I don't seem disrespectful. Uh, we've all agreed that we can refer to each other by our first names, uh, make this a little less um, intimidating, a little more informal. And, and then also, um, the now there was one other thing in there. Oh, it was one thing I've asked them now to give us each a short bio uh, of themselves. Tell us a little bit about themselves, and then we'll uh, jump in with some questions. Um, Lorraine, do you want to start, please? 
Sure. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Lorraine Ng, like John introduced me. I am the Assistant Director of Emergency Ultrasound, as well as the Director of Pediatric Emergency Ultrasound at the Children's Hospital of New York. Um, over the past almost 10 years, we've developed a great ultrasound program in our emergency department where we implement point of care ultrasound in our clinical integration and management of our pediatric patients. So I'm excited to talk to you guys about that this evening. Great. Now, without giving too much away, so you're using ultrasound both for uh, what for diagnostics for and diagnostic. other issues or other uh, applications? Yeah, for diagnostic as well as therapeutic interventions and clinical management to help us guide such things such as resuscitation and, and certain procedures like bladder, calf, and peripheral IVs. Great. We'll get we'll get, we'll get into that into some more detail here shortly. Uh, Dan, you're uh, you're up next. Everyone, thanks so much um, for joining us tonight. My name is Dan Fenster. Um, when I am not chasing around my three kids at home, um, I am also a um, husband to a physician. So we live a very busy home life. And when I go to work, I get to work with these amazing colleagues on, on the screen right now. Um, and many of them have um, been my teachers before me. So. Um, together, we help run um, some simulation programs, which uh, we'll go into a little bit more during the program, um, where we uh, train the next generation of physicians and we continue to train and practice um, ourselves at the sort of high stakes, low frequency events um, that is pediatric emergency medicine. Things have to change a little bit during the pandemic for training, which we'll go into. Um, but we continue uh, to this day to train, uh, to train hard because we know how much um, our services are needed for the, for the community. Thank you again. That's great. And I, I, I want to get more into that, the simulation there, because I think a lot of people um, don't quite appreciate how much that technology has changed and how it's improved the, uh, the training of, of doctors, not, not only present doctors, but future doctors as, as, as well. Um, David, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure, thanks, Max. Uh, I'm really excited to be here, especially with, uh, along with my friends and family um, from, from work. Um, I, I've been here the past 10 years, and as John said, I'm the Vice Chair currently of Innovation, uh, which is a pretty broad title, but loosely translated, I, I oversee our telehealth mission and our simulation mission, as well as uh, interfacing with um, different companies on new technology enterprises here. Uh, my personal research interest is in leveraging technology to improve care. Uh, over the past 10 years, I've worked with Lorraine to start our ultrasound program, worked with Dan on starting our simulation program, and, and various other innovations that um, we're doing in this really state-of-the-art emergency department. So I'm really excited to answer questions and have a good conversation today. Great. And technology has really changed then, the modern ED, hasn't it? Absolutely, whether it's something as mundane as the medical record, which is, um, you know, maybe not people's favorite topic, but, but certainly leads to some potential uh, innovations. Technological innovation has really been transformational within medicine for quite some time, but I think we're undergoing a particular leap right now with the digital revolution and the integration of artificial intelligence um, into our, our work environment. So it's uh, the technology and the revolution is just beginning, it sounds like. Um, and last, but certainly not least, Nazreen, tell us about yourself. Hi, Max. Thanks so much for having me here. I'm Nazreen Jamal. As John mentioned, um, I have two roles, one in education and quality, the other in quality. And my role kind of overlaps the two um, and really is based on how we can deliver the best patient care here. Um, and it's been a challenging year with COVID and trying to figure out how we can best educate our providers to kind of stay on top of what we need to do in this new kind of landscape. So as long as we've got you here uh, and you're up and unmuted, uh, let's start with, with, with some questions for you because uh, I think a lot of people in general and certainly parents uh, were very hesitant to come into the hospital uh, and, or, and especially bring their children into the um, uh, emergency department especially since that's where they assume the sickest people were. What have you done uh, to, kind of, to ensure the safety of the patients coming into the uh, pediatric ED? 
Certainly, I think that's a great question and something we all struggled with at the beginning of the pandemic when we actually ourselves weren't sure how safe the ED would be for our patients. I think over the last several months, we've done several things that um, we now feel very com confident and comfortable with the care we're providing. Um, the ED looks very different than it used to be, so our volumes are down, um, but we are focusing on providing efficient care with full PPE on for all of our patients. So families who come to the ED will see things differently than they had before. We're in universal PPE precautions, and that includes our patients and their guardians. So there's universal masking, temperature scanning prior to coming in, and a series of questions to ensure that families um, don't have any symptoms of COVID before they come here so that we can best protect them and the other patients. Um, we still provide care to everybody who walks through the ED and we try to provide as efficient care as possible so that they're not spending time in the waiting room. Um, unfortunately, some of the fun things that they might have enjoyed, like the toys and things like that, are no longer available, um, but we feel like it's a safe trade-off for their health and well-being. Should, should a child come in with suspected COVID or some of the COVID symptoms, what do you do in that, uh, in that to make sure that everybody's safe? Yeah, so you know, we assume that everybody has COVID symptoms, and I think that's been the safest approach because we really can't differentiate. And so um, we provide care to everyone. If we anticipate that they are going to need any respiratory support, such as nebulizers or positive pressure ventilation, we put them into specific negative pressure rooms. But otherwise, we use universal gowning, both from our provider end and our patient end, to protect the patients from each other and from their family members. Um, and it's worked quite well. Uh, we certainly have seen several patients with COVID, but we've been able to, I think, do a good job of um, maintaining social distancing, even in the ER setting. David, how, uh, in, in, in circumstances like this, where everybody's a little bit hesitant about all, all of this, have you um, done very much to sort of expand your reach, if you will, your catchment area to, to make sure that um, everyone who needs uh, emergency care for their for their children actually know about you know what the safety is and and tell them that it's okay yeah so I wonder if David might be able to kind of help answer that question because I think we've done a lot of things to basically bring care to our patients where they need it and the telehealth program has um, provided an opportunity to kind of bring care to our patients rather than having to bring them to the ED when it's unnecessary yeah I actually I was hoping David would chime in there go ahead, go ahead and tell me David yeah, well, it's been challenging, and I think, um, you know, because people are obviously nervous to, to get outside their apartments, let alone come to the hospital if they don't need to be. Telehealth has been a fantastic bridge for that in that um, it's almost like in-home triage. Obviously, if anyone has a, a, you know, a serious or obvious emergency, we want them to call 911, but there's a lot of gray zone. You know, maybe someone gets a cut and they're not sure if it needs to be sewed up, and so telehealth can really help us to, to evaluate the patient in their home. Um, frankly, I mean, we love it. Um, you get to see the same uh, doctors as a patient that you see on this panel, same that you would see in the emergency room. And we love it because we see where you live um, and we could sort of uh, see you sort of in that place um, and hopefully avoid an ER visit that might not be necessary and, and, you know, just help you sort of get to the next step and back to your pediatrician. I imagine that community pediatricians um, hear a lot of uh, hesitation uh, from parents of, of children who may need uh, uh, emergent care. Uh, how do you speak to both the pediatricians and, and the parents to, uh, to reassure them? In other words, when do they really need to go to the ED? I mean, that's an excellent question. And, you know, I invite my colleagues to pipe in as well. It's sort of an age old question that we get in the emergency medicine even before COVID. And, you know, when is it necessary to come in? And, and other than the medical reasons for coming in, um, sometimes there's other concerns. Um, for, you know, time of day, perhaps, you know, when your job will allow you to see someone uh, that's open during the day uh, versus 24 seven. As emergency medicine doctors, we're, we're constantly available. That's one of our specialties. And so we're always here for you, whether it's, you know, life-threatening injury or not. Um, so, you know, just broadly speaking, and I, I'd love to hear others, you know, spiel on this, but, you know, I, we'll typically go the ABCs is how we think it through. So, you know, a problem with your airway is really imminent. You know, obviously uh, someone stops breathing or turns color, you know, choking, those things, you know, we need to see you imminently. 
um, you know, so anything with the airway or the breathing. And then of course, circulatory problems, which fortunately are less common in children compared to adults, you know, um, might involve someone having a problem with their heart beating abnormal, abnormally or chest pain um, or, or, you know, again, sort of feeling lethargic or out of it. Most of what we see is really infectious concerns in children, I'd say. So we're quite mm. used to that even pre-COVID. Um, now I think that um, we're managing it even better now in terms of, uh, as Nezreen mentioned, um, the safety around which we will treat uh, people, we'll put them in an isolation room, and the providers and the doctors will also be wearing you know, proper protections in and out of that room all the time. And David, if I, or Max, if I can even chime in also, I think it's, um, as community pediatricians, it's also nice to know that the ED is a staff not only 24-7, but by pediatric emergency medicine trained physicians, as well as acute care pediatricians. So there's a, so the acute care pediatricians, some of them work in both settings, in the community pediatric setting, as well as the emergency department. So they, they're, um, they really know both worlds extremely well. Uh, we know our our field, um, and they're really able to help navigate some of those, you know, do I need the ER or do I not? And we're always available um, to call, you know, if, if, if it's three o'clock in the morning and you want to refer a patient into us or you want to call to think, to see if a referral is indicated, we're there for you. So we, we serve that purpose as well. Um, and as, you know, all my colleagues on here, you know, would attest, we, we get a good amount of those phone calls. And sometimes that telehealth triage is a good little bridge between um, sometimes we do need that visual. So there's, um, um, I'm sure uh, Dr. Kessler will go into some of the opportunities for how to access that telehealth over time. And, and Dan, have you been getting that message out to, uh, again, the community to make sure that they know what steps you've taken to ensure the safety? Uh, that, that's, I think, the area that, that so many people are concerned about, that they're, it's safe to bring their children in. Yeah, I think that's um, that's a really good point, and 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 I'm also hoping that a session like this is really um, going to help with that. There's also um, publications that we've been putting out on uh, different disease processes that during the peak of COVID, and this is really in different countries in the world as well, presented very late to emergency departments. Things that are trivial problems in uh, you know appendicitis, for example. Um, you know, it needs, it needs to go to the ED, it needs a, a quick operation, and you're usually home the next day. During COVID, for example, we saw a lot of those cases come several days into the, its time course, which is something unusual for a lot of us who have always worked in big city hospitals. Um, so if, uh, like David said, if you, if you have an acute emergency of your airway, your breathing, your, you know, feeling like your heart is racing, things like this, you need to call 911 to go to the ED, but using your pediatrician or a virtual urgent care program as a triage point could be very helpful too. Got it. Good. I think Good. the irony is, you know, it's probably never been a safer time to come through our ED. Um, you know, the news is, you know, and our literature has talked about ED overcrowding as a problem, you know, over the past decade. And uh, now it's, it's, uh, it's concierge service. I mean, we have a room for every patient. It's really, there's never been a safer time in my mind to come without having to pay for concierge service, I guess, huh? <laughs> I'll leave that to John. <laughs> Lorraine, let's talk, let's talk technology, because it sounds like, uh, from what I've been reading, that one of the really transformative technologies uh, in the emergency department, especially for children, has been this uh, point-of-care ultrasound, right? Uh, with the lovely uh, acronym of POCUS, uh, before it, which I, I, it takes all I got to not say hocus pocus, uh, <laughs> but tell us how that's used and, and, and why that's been so transformative. Yeah, so it's funny that you say hocus pocus because when we first started off, people would think that it was just a toy, um, not a skill that people would use in the emergency department. And I feel that mm. the Carol Dresson has really been transformative in that leaves my own personal clinical practice and even within the practice of our entire pediatric emergency department. Um, we use this on a daily basis with patients, especially during COVID. I felt like during the pandemic, it really highlighted how we were able to use our skill set to help triage patients and manage their disposition. A patient coming in with respiratory distress, we could use lung ultrasound to evaluate um, certain signs on ultrasound, looking for evidence of potentially COVID. A lot of the literature that was coming out initially 
especially out of China, was saying that you, um, they would use chest CTs to diagnose COVID in patients, which is really not the safest and most feasible way to manage our pediatric patients. So we implemented pathways where we could use lung ultrasound to potentially diagnose and also continue to clinically manage patients as their clinical course changed during the, their emergency department stay. And then as NIST-C started to develop in, and we started seeing case presentations, that revolutionized the way we manage these patients. I remember actually we had a shift, Ms. Rina and I, we saw one of the first NIST-C patients coming into our emergency department and we're like, this kid looks like Kawasaki, but nothing else really fits Kawasaki. He's really hypotensive. And we were able within a few minutes to use our point of care ultrasound at the bedside to evaluate his heart function, his lung function, how, whether or not we needed to resuscitate him with fluids and how aggressively we could do that. So it's really, really revolutionized our, our clinical practice. Wow. So, so to be clear, before you were able to use uh, POCUS in, in the ED, what would you have had to do here? It, it really is a, an amazing change, but what, would, what, what was the old way? So I'm old enough to know what it was like to not practice with POCUS, but I can barely remember because, like I said, it's changed my practice. But beforehand, you would use your clinical, your history, your physical exam, your stethoscope, and other, other um, methods of assessing the patient. You know, laboratory markers, radiology, things like chest x-ray, and, and CTs and MRIs, which have their own potential risks for the patients. Point of care ultrasound is not to replace ultrasound that's done by radiology, but it's used more from our acute clinical management at the bedside. And one of the things that I feel has helped us the most is that we have it available at the bedside. And whenever a patient has a clinical change, we can roll the machine right in and assess what the change is and, and acutely manage that change and, um, and determine the disposition. That's, uh, that's amazing. And it, it's, uh, and to be clear, this is something that indivi the individual uh, emergency medicine physician would run the test or the scan, if you will. And that's not, that takes training in order to be able to do it right. Right. Yeah. So I think one of the differences is with point of care ultrasound versus Department of Radiology ultrasound is that point, point of care ultrasound, we say POCUS because it's a lot easier to say than point of care ultrasound. Um, but at the bedside, the physician is obtaining the images and interpreting them immediately versus when you send a patient to radiology, the, the technician obtains the ultrasound images. We have to wait for them to upload the images. We have to wait for the radiologist to interpret the images and then report it back to you. So there is a time lag from that standpoint. So we found that by training our providers to perform point of care ultrasound, which is specifically looking to answer yes, no questions in the emergency department. Does this patient have a pneumonia? Does this patient require more fluid resuscitation? Does this patient have good cardiac contractility? Does this patient have tamponade physiology? Or even something more bread and butter, does this patient have enough urine in their bladder for me to perform a urine catheterization before we perform mm -hmm. this catheterization? Do we have, oh, do we, does this patient have a good vein for us to perform a, a peripheral IV in this arm or should we look at different sites? So obviously this is a very unique and specific skill set and I'm really proud of the emergency department as Dave, and Dave said earlier that we've built over the past 10 years. We've trained up our faculty so that most of our faculty are comfortable in a lot of the core ultrasound applications so you can use it at the bedside. And Max, Lorraine's yeah. being modest. I mean, she's one of the Jedi masters of ultrasound. And I think what's interesting about this technology is it's relative to other imaging technology, cheap, uh, it's portable, um, and it, you know, it's very dependent upon the user so you can get as good as you want. Uh, this, this new generation coming up, they're gobbling it up. Uh, when Lorraine and I started with this, it was really sort of transforming an old dogma about how to care for patients. Uh, and I will say definitively, I mean, I've, we have lots of cherished colleagues around the country who, who are experts in ultrasound and pediatrics. Our department, hands down, has one of the largest quorums of people who are not only facile at this, but expert. And it's allowed us to transform then our clinical integration of the technology. So it's not just one person when they're on using it, but we've changed our, our whole management for certain uh, disease processes because we have so many people facile with it. And I'd add to that as well, our nursing colleagues who... Uh, recently ha have a, a, you know, developed their own internal policy and training program to do ultrasound-guided vascular access. 
Uh, most of the parents I talk to, that's one of the biggest fears they have going to the to the ER, and especially if you have a, a, you're a parent of a kid with chronic uh, disease who has to get multiple sticks every time they come. So knowing that we have this technology that our nurses are using to help try to get that stick on one try, um, it, it's really trans transformed you know, our care for children. Just one more thing on top of that even, if I can add anything to what Lorraine and David, who are some of the national experts on this topic, but as a level one pediatric trauma center in the region, um, really over the last, I would say, decade or so, we've really started to use um, the focused abdominal sonography and trauma, the FAST exam, as, as our standard of care in the trauma bay for, for patients who meet specific criteria. Whereas um, when I started my fellowship training in 2010, that was not the case. Um, lots of patients were getting CAT scans, and now we're really targeting that, that radiology, uh, that formal radiology study of whether it's a re repeat ultrasound or it's a CAT scan of a specific body part, rather than sort of the head-to-toe CAT scan, we're really using ultrasound to help guide acute management. Right, and, and sparing the child uh, unnecessary radiation. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Nazreen, let's talk about, um, I've got my child with me, feverish, either crying, maybe lethargic. What does the ED look, how does the ED look different now, the modern ED compared to what perhaps some of us have in our heads when we, you know, got hit in the head by a baseball playing Little League or slipped and fell and cut ourselves, something like that. How different is it? So I'd like to think that it doesn't, it might look a little bit different to the outsider, but I think on the inside, it feels very much the same in terms of our team-based approach to care. Um, as David said, I think because of the volumes being down, we are much more streamlined than we used to be. Uh, the questions and the screening and the feeling of maybe being have to ask some things before you get into the room might be a little off-putting to families, but we try to emphasize that that's for their safety to ask them questions about any COVID exposures. Uh, I think the hardest thing that we find is that um, we used to be able to make friends with children a little bit faster, but now that we're covered head to toe in PPE, it's a little bit harder to not seem um, even more foreign than we already do. And that's unfortunately something that I think is going to be here to stay between the masks and the goggles. But um, we are fortunate to have our child life specialists on board and in the ED as we used to. And so we found ways to um, entertain our kids and make friends with them, uh, still have iPad technology and those types of things to make sure that uh, children still feel safe and welcome in the ED. Uh, but I do think that the families appreciate that we're keeping our distance a little bit more and we try to minimize interactions in the room whenever possible. Uh, we've utilized phones in the rooms, which is a little bit different for lab test results and things like that. We'll call families and let them know. And we let them know in advance that we might not come in as often, but again, it's to minimize exposure to the families of coming inside and outside of the room. And so there are little things that are different, um, but we hope that the end result is that they're still getting the care that they need in an uh, expeditious way. And so you're wearing PPEs regardless of whether you suspect a, a COVID patient? Yeah, we're you re, uh, using PPE and changing it after each encounter. So we wear eye protection and masks and um, gowns with each patient. Good, good. Max, uh, the other thing I yeah. guess I want to add to that is referencing back to what David was saying about telehealth, because I think a lot of the things that Nazreen just mentioned were about kind of trying to streamline that visit so that families don't have to spend an extended amount of time in the ED. As Lorraine mentioned, ultrasound, a point of care particularly, can help do that for sure, but also telehealth, because what we've started to do is allow some of the follow-up, some of those questions to say, you know, you know, you know, we feel like you're stable, we feel like you can go home, your child is in good shape, but we wanna be able to check in with you. How can we do that? How can we also add a visual check-in and telehealth has allowed us to do that? So I think that being able to leverage some of these things can help to really impact the time that families spend. And we know that time is more exposure and that people don't wanna be there for a long time. So I think a lot of what you're hearing are things that help to address that issue. Well, John, you anticipated a question, but as long as you, you brought up the topic, um, I think a lot of people also are, are kind of surprised to hear that you can actually accomplish some, uh, you can actually do a lot and accomplish a lot via telehealth. I mean, everybody knows if I show my dermatologist a rash, 
he'll probably be able to, he or she will probably be able to figure that out. But if you've got a sick child, um, they might be surprised, but you can really do a lot of diagnosis and, and, and accomplish a lot of things uh, with, this, with telehealth technology. Or Dan or John? Just unmuted. I, I, I certainly um, would vouch for that. I think that one of the things that we recognized, and then Dan, I'll let you follow up, um, was that we were able to uh, provide a lot of guidance and continue to. So I think what we, what we saw during the, certainly the peak of the pandemic, uh, particularly in pediatrics, was a lot of questions, a lot of questions about, uh, you know, what about this and what if this happens next? And I think we were certainly in a position where we were learning every day. Um, and I know Nazreen, for one, helped to lead our efforts to develop pathways, as was mentioned, and what could be anticipated to happen next and what should we do if that's the case. Um, the, several on the team also developed similar pathways for approach to telehealth and COVID. So if someone calls with questions, what are those answers we can give them? How can we direct them to an appropriate place of care if needed? And I think those kind of things, which someone otherwise might struggle to find, was something that telehealth allows us to do. So um, certainly that kind of guidance, but Dan, I'll let you expand on that. Yeah, no, and it was really um, interesting to utilize telehealth within the ED during the peak of COVID and some of those uh, technologies we're still using today. So when you ask like what does a modern 21st century ED look like, sometimes when you go in you're going to see an ED provider and a nurse and, and the care from the primary team, but then we might need assistance from consults, uh, from experts in neurology or psychiatry or whatnot, and there's also a question in the Q&A about are you seeing more mental, mental health uh, referrals to the ED. And we're using telehealth within the ED um, for some of those services. So during the peak of COVID, when the rates were super, super high, we, we didn't even want those consults coming into the ED to potentially get exposed. So we would consult them through tablets within the ED and they would have a visual consultation with the patient. And a lot of those consultations um, or office visits are continuing in the outpatient setting today. I'm sure a lot of the pediatricians on this call are, are using telehealth in one way or another. And to answer the question of, are we seeing increased mental health evaluations in the ED? I don't have the numbers in front of me, but um, anecdotally, it does seem that way. And we are primarily using um, a telepsychiatry. Um, our psychiatry mm -hmm. colleagues are available by consultation. And obviously, if they need to come to the ED for a specific reason they will and they're available to, but uh, patients uh, are primarily getting telehealth evaluations for their mental health concerns. And along those lines, one of the other things that Dan helped to spearhead was leveraging telehealth uh, for our handoff process with high-risk patients going from the ED to the ICU. And I think that that's an example of something that could have lasting implications well beyond COVID and the pandemic, et cetera. Um, what we realized is that there's a real opportunity to better connect around the care using that modality. And I don't know, if Danny, if you want to quickly uh, mention anything more about that, but it was quite helpful. You no, know, it, it, it's basically just that instead of giving, um, you know, transporting a, tel a, a COVID positive or a, you know, COVID patient under investigation to an ICU to give a handoff in person um, exposes a lot of additional individuals uh, to that patient's COVID and protects, you know, to, to reduce nosocomial spread. We want very, very few people doing that. So we're giving a lot of the handoff that could just be done by phone, but this way there's the the human uh, aspect of the handoff by being able to see the person that you're handing off the care to. And they could also look at the patient virtually before they arrive into their intensive care unit. So more to come on that um, in terms of developing it. We've, we've piloted it with some success. Lorraine, coincidentally, um, just this week, I've been uh, looking at uh, some and researching for, for a story, um, some kind of point of care, some POCUS, type of uh, uh, ultrasound uh, technology, not so much for children, but for, but for adults and COVID and so forth. And the way the one doctor described it to me, uh, you know, you don't have to call uh, radiology and have a portable x-ray come up or, the, uh, or, or some of the other machinery or send them down to radiology. Sounds like you're putting a lot of people out of work, um, but what about 
especially in this time, because of, there are a lot of people who uh, are having financial difficulty. Is that, do you guys bill for that? How, is, how, how does that work? I think there's definitely more than enough work to go around and what we do in the emergency department from point of care ultrasound is very different and unique to the emergency department and by no means takes away from the expertise that we rely upon from our radiology colleagues. So I definitely think there's more than enough to go around and we are billing and credentialing, but it's a different, it's a more, um, it's a very focused, we bill for a very focused exam. And in the emergency department, when we have patients where we do a point of care ultrasound, and then we want a further confirmatory study with ultrasound with radiology, and then we'll defer that billing to the Department of Radiology. So we're de there's definitely no double dipping or anything. Everything is in the best interest of the patient care. Um, and I don't think we're trying to put anyone out of a job. <laughs> good, good, fair, fair enough. Um, David, I saw some notes here um, in when we were talking before about uh, dwindling numbers around the country. What does that refer to? Is that of physicians or patients coming in? We still have plenty of sick people. Um, I'm, I'm, it's your notes, Mac. No, I'm guessing it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> is, I'm guessing that's uh, dwindling numbers of patients coming in, perhaps. Um, and I mean, I, I think that um, there's a real question of, are we ever going back? You know, because the reality is, especially in a New York City urban practice environment, and others feel free to disagree. Um, I think that a certain percentage of the patients we saw, quote unquote, did not need an emergency department. They might be there for other reasons related to uh, lack of access to uh, other primary care options or you know, availability of that, et cetera. Um, and so you know, part of me wonders, are, you know, are we moving towards a new model, especially with the growth of telehealth? not just in the emergency department, but with our ambulatory care uh, practice colleagues. Now, um, you know, your doctor's more accessible in general and your emergency doctor's, you know, accessible without even having to come in. Um, so I just want to see immediate uh, delivered care. Um, one thing that um, I'm interested in uh, is seeing this intersection of telehealth with um, remote patient monitoring and imaging. So we're trialing some efforts to um, give you the ultrasound at home and then have you know, Lorraine remotely guide you through it and read it. I mean, that's something that we're very interested in looking mm -hmm. into. Of course, you know, the payer has not caught up to that. You know, uh, there's issues around billing and regulatory, but uh, from a pragmatic standpoint, Certainly from my experience during COVID, I would have loved that additional data of the patient I'm seeing on telehealth of how do those lungs look every day. I mean, essentially, it could let me, uh, give me x-ray vision to that patient. So I don't, Lorraine, what do you think about that? <laughs> I mean, I think, <laughs> I mean, our colleagues, even in the emergency department, when they're performing point of care ultrasound, they, if they have a specific question, I will get texts and calls at all hours of the night, which I openly ask for and, and welcome them. Um, to to consult and kind of you know figure out collectively how we can best provide care to this patient and if utilizing point of care ultrasound can help that patient then using then doing a tele ultrasound um, consult if you will is is definitely better for the patient you raise a good point Lorraine about doing it not just for patients in the home which might be the next leap but actually just doing it for our colleagues in the ED uh, mm -hmm. now you know our colleagues around the country I think if we could you know, figure out how to facilitate that cross, um, you know, institution consult. I think we really could democratize, you know, access to this, uh, not just the technology, but the experts like Lorraine. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so as as long as they brought up the topic, Nazarene, tell me between, it sounds like between telehealth, remote monitoring, other technologies, uh, as well as uh, a hesitancy to bring uh, kids in perhaps these days, uh, it has the volume change and has the type of patient you're seeing uh, change. They're, they're, they've gotten sicker, they're not using the ED as much as a primary care referral. Uh, how has that changed? That's a great question. Um, certainly, I think our volumes have changed nationally. We've kind of compared numbers of pediatric visits, and they certainly are down everywhere. And our acuity 
has seemed to increase over um, this period of time, meaning the portion of patients that are coming to the ED who have acute care needs is higher, which is good in the sense that the patients who need to be in the emergency room are here. One of the things that we've been seeing a little bit of, um, and one of the things we hope not to see too much of is delayed presentations of disease. I think Dan was alluding to um, a lot of perforated appendicitis, especially in mm -hmm. March and April, uh, when the pandemic um, was really at a peak, we've been seeing a lot of oncologic diagnoses and a lot of them later in their care. I think because those diagnoses are harder to make and can often present in vague ways that um, might, without being able to see the full picture, you might not really pick up that there's something else. Um, what some of, something that the ED offers that I think that we are not able yet to provide in outpatient settings in the same way is the rapid access to whatever tests need to be done. So as um, Lorraine said, sometimes we're good with a POCUS, but sometimes the POCUS reveals that there's more that needs to be investigated, and that will lead us to an MRI that we can get in a timely manner. Sometimes we can get the history and physical on telehealth, but we realize that we need some lab data to understand what a patient's cell lines look like and that there's really no other expeditious way in this current climate for a family to get a lab value and to be able to know within an hour or two if their child's labs are normal. Um, so those are some things that we're still able to provide in the ED setting that I, I don't see really being, um, in our current healthcare climate, being able to be offered in a different way. So we are still seeing um, a, a lot of sick patients um, and the volume of patients is down overall. I think a lot of that is the lower acuity patients and uh, possibly just mm. infectious disease in general might be down because of mask wearing. Uh, and trauma patients, Dan might be able to speak to a little bit, um, our trauma volumes are higher than they have been previously and probably owing to a lot of different uh, circumstances. Yeah, and, and the, the patients being admitted to the hospital with trauma though are, are down because there's, there's just people doing less outdoors. Um, so we're, mon we're monitoring that. Uh, are Nazarene, are our parents bringing kids in for flu shots? I might let John take that in, but we don't yet offer flu shots in the emergency room, but we are okay. partnering with our clinic um, colleagues to figure out the best way to get that to our patients. All right. Dan, let, let, let me, let me, let's go back to uh, technology here and simulation. Um, tell me what you can do with, with simulation now. Um, everybody who's uh, gone through uh, med school knows the old uh, saw of uh, see one, do one, teach one, which uh, I think if the general public knew about that, they'd be a little bit uh, concerned. But simulation has really completely uh, changed that uh, paradigm and made made everything much safer, no? Yeah, and actually, the what we say now is see one, simulate many, and then when you are competent, then you can do one. Um, but we... We offer multiple types of simulation education to different trainee groups and even faculty groups. Um, but the one that's been most consistently, the program that's been maintained over the last decade is our, what we call in situ. So a, a simulation program in the place that we work. So not in some laboratory, not in a classroom, but in the place that we work to not only train with the team that will take care of the patient that will come in with the respiratory distress or the cardiac event, uh, but also allows us to, um, to look at our workplace and see ways that we can optimize it. So are, are the pieces of equipment in the right place? Um, do we have all the equipment that we need? And, and week by week, um, we, we continue to improve um, our emergency department with, uh, with, with this type of a program. So it's, again, wonderful for trainees, but um, I don't want the message to go out that it's just for training uh, residents and students and fellows. It's also for continuing med medical education for attending physicians um, and for nurses and for systems improvement. Can you give me an example of what sorts of things uh, do you do both with residents and then for uh, physicians and, and staff in the ED? Yeah, so we, we use a, a multidisciplinary approach where we really have uh, learner groups from the various disciplines that work in the ED, both the medical disciplines and the, um, the non-sort um, of medical disciplines, social work and pastoral care and all the different people that might uh, be involved in your child's care um, for different types of scenarios. So we might have uh, something as simple as, uh, you know, a, a mannequin, a patient who's who's hit by a car and we will activate our trauma team 
um, in real life, in, in sort of real life. We'll bring down the trauma surgeons and we'll, we'll uh, run a case with them and then discuss about things that went well and things that didn't go well. And then we go back to the drawing board and we try to figure out systems improvements. And it's a really good way to work with colleagues who you may not know on a first name basis. And then after these training programs, you know, you, you, you really know the people that you're working with your consultants. Um, and then we might have even much more complex cases like, um, you know, patients with, uh, you know, Nazreen was mentioning oncologic diagnoses, you know, patients with, with cancer. And while, while people hear simulation, they think of the high fidelity, you know, the mannequin that looks exactly like a human. And we do have that. But really what produces the, the quality education is the people getting in a room focused on a mission to improve patient care. And it could be honestly with a sheet and a pillow half the time. It doesn't need to be with the, the fancy robot. And I think one of the strengths of the simulation program that uh, Dan and Dave have built up there being modest is that it's, like you said, it's multidisciplinary. It's not just physicians. We do this every single Thursday with the nursing team, the techs, the unit assistants, child life, pharmacy. So everyone has, mm -hmm. has multiple opportunities to practice the simulation events in real time. So when the real patient comes in, we've, we've all gotten more comfortable in our roles versus just isolated simulation events where we're doing teaching with residents, everyone in the emergency department works together as a team to simulate. And I think that's one of the huge benefits of the program. It's interesting, it's sort of the medical application of what the airline industry has done for many years with flight simulators and throwing curveballs at, uh, at any conceivable emergency at the pilots and making sure that everybody knows what they're supposed to do. Uh, so David, you brought up technology and evolution of things previously. Um, what do you see that uh, Columbia Children's Hospital is, is doing that you think could or should be emulated, if you will, uh, at other uh, EDs? And is that just for large academic centers or can it be done in, in community hospitals? It's a great question. Uh... I think, you know, two things off the top of my head. One is we've talked a lot about ultrasound. That's available. People should learn and get great about it. It's affordable. And even, you know, whatever the setting, I think um, it can start to be adopted more widely. Uh, it's, not, it's not really, you know, standard of care in that everyone wears a stethoscope. Not everyone has the ultrasound. Um, and I think that, you know, that stands to be improved. The other thing is that our, our colleague Dan C, our colleague Dan C uh, has really revolutionized our pain and sedation program. So again, like probably the thing I fear most as a dad is, you know, seeing my children in pain. And when they come to the emergency department, we have so many options there. Uh, and I think that if you're gonna be a world-class uh, emergency department that treats children, um, you, you know, children really deserve to have all those options on the table, not just limited to, to, to one modality. So some of those things include, and each one has a different use, you know, it would be like uh, nitrous, the dental gas. Um, we have, we could do uh, nerve blocks under ultrasound guidance, you know, so that it's just all, all regional. Uh, we have various uh, intravenous medicines that we could use to put someone uh, really um, more, more altered, more asleep during a procedure that, that's going to be very painful. Um, and, and we have intranasal medicines that we don't have to put any kind of needle in your child at all um, mm. to sort of start the, the pain control and or anxiety um, control uh, for, for even minor procedures. What am I missing, guys? I feel like we have more. Oh, then, of course, you know, child life and uh, non-pharmacologic interventions, mm -hmm. uh, world class. Um, I, I've learned so much from my child life colleagues. And uh, but uh, but they'll you know, I could never replace what they do. So I'm so grateful to have them around. Uh, really, um, for so many cases, I don't need any medicine at all because of their ability to, to keep a patient entertained, calm and, and deal with their anxiety. Interesting. And Lorraine, the it other, like uh, modality, sorry to interrupt. The other modality is nitrous. Um, Dave, in addition to intranasal, there's also nitrous, which typically is what people think of as laughing gas in the in the dentist's office. But we also have that available in our emergency department as well, which is a great um, which is a great uh, analgesic for pediatric patients. Which we mm -hmm. have been using less during COVID, just because of the potential for aerosolization. Oh. It has been a great option right. for. Um, providing pain right. in our pediatric patients. 
polka sounds like the kind of thing that could be scalable or sent, you know, put out into uh, smaller and, and community uh, hospitals. You just, you need the equipment, but you also need to train people. Um, is, do you have a training program that you can help, say, the, the community uh, ED uh, docs who would like to utilize POCUS? Because it sounds like it's a terrific tool. Yeah, no, absolutely. We, I mean, integral to our whole educational program is point of care ultrasound for our fellows and our residents and our colleagues who are attendings and nurses. If there's anyone out in the community who wants to increase utilization of point of care ultrasound, there are definitely opportunities and you can feel free to reach out to myself or David to, to discuss how to learn that. Just because even in the office, in the pediatrics office, you can, pediatrician's office, you can use ultrasound to evaluate the bladder prior to doing it in a bladder cath. Um, if you're going to, if you have a patient who you're worried about whether or not to have pneumonia rather than sending to the emergency department, you could potentially just pull out a portable ultrasound machine, which there are a, var a variety of them on the market, pull out a portable ultrasound machine and take a look at the lungs and then start the patient on antibiotics if you need. I don't know if David, if you want to elaborate on that. Well, no, I mean, the office setting is such a great, um, I think, growing market for this as well, or space where it really can improve care. Um, abscess identification versus cellulitis, um, vaccine reactions versus cellulitis. You know, um, there are so many applications that could be done. Uh, even without, um, you know, too much expertise, you know, just learning a little bit. One thing about ultrasound is that um, with very little training, you could sort of get the basics and start to be able to have that x-ray vision. It takes a lot more training to know what kind of decisions to make with it. And as Lorraine said earlier, you know, we really focus early on on making careful yes-no decisions so it doesn't become this, um, you know, I, I don't know what the word is. You don't want to be uh, careless with it in what you see, right? You want to be specific about what you're doing, but you can throw a probe on the abdomen. Obviously, in our center now, we have expertise to identify appendicitis. That would be sort of a mm. skill that would take some time, but it's easy for, for anyone, even when they're starting out, to throw the probe on and notice that there's fluid there, and then just that would be enough to say, well, I should do something else now. Why is there fluid there? Um, and so as you grow with it, you have more ability to diagnose different pathology. It's like every other tool. You have to use it appropriately, or it's really, uh, it's really either going to lead you down the wrong path or going to be useless. Um, let me throw this one question out here. We've still got a few minutes left to see uh, which one of you might want to uh, tackle this. I, I hear a lot about how uh, the ED is evolving, uh, technology is changing, uh, both the patients and, and the way you practice uh, in the ED. So where is it going? What's the ED of the future going to look like? Ah, stumped you. Well, I'm going to give I'm going to give it one shot, and then um, I have a feeling Dr. Kessler is going to follow me up. But to me, it's about the right care for the right patient at the right time, and it doesn't almost matter what building you're in. I really think that's important to 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 put out there, because um, David and Lorraine were just saying that you could you could diagnose a pneumonia with an ultrasound uh, in the pediatrician's office just like you can in the emergency department. So I think really knowing. Um, we have several partner hospitals, uh, community hospitals, that, that um, do refer patients to the children's hospital uh, when that higher level of care is needed. But there's a lot of children that go to those emergencies, emergency rooms. Most children do not go to a pediatric emergency department across the country and, and, and in our region as well. They go to our affiliate hospitals, and sometimes they don't need to be transferred to us. We can give recommendations by seeing the patient with telehealth, um, getting perhaps some imaging modalities there and consulting with, um, with people that we need to. So we don't have, that patient doesn't have to schlep over to our hospital to get the same diagnostic workup. Now, if they need a pediatric surgeon or they need a pediatric intensive care unit, sure, those are, those are indications to come over. Um, but if, if a patient presents to hospital X or to hospital Y, they should get the same standard of care. And the children's hospital is there as um, maybe the mothership to help guide the care for that patient, but it's more that than the building that they're in. Yeah, Dan, Dan, you hit the nail on the head as well as knowing I would talk after that. Uh, <laughs> um, 
no, I think that, you know, the, the days of brick and mortar are as being where our boundary ends and emergency department are over, right? So we're already stretching out with telehealth, but I see sort of a more intimate link happening with our community paramedicine program. Um, I mean, while you're in the ambulance, maybe you're getting the ultrasound and Lorraine is reading it back in the ED, preparing and getting ready for what's going to come. Um, you know, and, and I think as we get more adept with sort of the technology of, of collaboration, as Dan is sort of alluding to, then I think you'll see our tentacles sort of stretching into the community uh, to get a sort of earlier start on managing emergencies that are, uh, you know, time sensitive and uh, really just increasingly doing a better job through integration of that technology. So Nazarene, it sounds like uh, eventually the patients who do make it to the ED for you are probably going to be a lot sicker. Uh, I think what we've learned this year is we don't know how to predict what's coming next. Um, and mm -hmm. we just have to prepare ourselves for anything. Um, I'm proud to be part of a team that's really done a great job of being adapted, uh, adapting and just figuring it out as we go along to try to do the best thing we can for our patients when they do show up. Great. So we've covered an awful lot of material here and I wanna be respectful of, of people's time. I have, uh, given uh, our panelists, uh, and I want to thank them very much because I've learned a lot just listening tonight uh, about how things are changing in the pediatric ED, but I've given them the heads up uh, to give us a little take home pearl of wisdom uh, from uh, what we've talked about uh, this evening. What do you want our listeners or viewers here to remember about what we've spoken about tonight? And uh, Lorraine, you're at the top left of my uh, screen, so you get to go first. Um, even though point of care ultrasound like, sounds like a very daunting technology, it's actually a very readily available and usable technology that can really change our clinical management in an instant at the bedside. And I feel that the future of our emergency ultrasound department has a great um, opportunity to further integrate point of care ultrasound into the clinical care. Good, good. Daniel, Dan, you're next. Well, my last answer was going to be my go-to, but I got to go do another one. Um, no, I think it's important as parents, um, you know, hesitate to bring their children to the emergency department. Just know that we are training and retraining and continually training every day. This is what we do for a living. Um, we're not a pediatric emergency room or a pediatric emergency department. We have we do research on what we do. We are constantly innovating and changing, um, and you should have uh, full faith in sending your patients to us. Good. I was going to ask you earlier, is schlep a medical term, by the way? In New York, anyway. it is. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Schlepp and schnitzel. Yeah. So, Nazreen, you, you complimented all of your colleagues, but now tell me what, what you want people uh, at home to remember. So I think, um, especially to our uh, pediatrician colleagues who are out there, I think that there's always the concern about sending an unnecessary ED visit, and we all hesitate, even with our own children, of should I go to the ER? Um, and you can always call. I think that's one of the things that we probably, I think Dan said that we get several calls, but we probably don't get as many calls about should I send this patient to the ER? And we're always happy to hear from you if you're not sure. It would it be safe to say if uh, when in doubt, bring them in? Yeah, I think prior to COVID that was safe. I think now people really are always fully in doubt. So sometimes it's helpful to just get another, even if it's just to validate that it's fine to do so, we're always happy to feel that call. Good. Well, David, you get the last word. Wow. Um, yeah, well, I'll say <laughs> as my take home, the only constant, it really is change, but we don't do change for change's sake. I think what I value in this group is, is uh, we really have our, our roots and our underpinning in evidence-based medicine, um, but we end up on the leading edge because we're early adopters of innovation. We study it, and um, we want to learn and grow and sort of do everything we can to give it the best care to, to the patients that we see. Good enough. I want to thank all of our panelists tonight for a, a really fascinating uh, conversation. I, I learned a lot myself. Uh, here, and uh, I'll put that to you somewhere here shortly. Um, and uh, a reminder that this will be posted on the YouTube channel, Columbia Children's Health channel on YouTube, so you can go back and refer to that. And John, is there anything you'd like to say to uh, wrap up tonight? Well, uh, Max, I want to thank you and uh, and most of all, uh, thank the, the team here 
Um, this is a great group to work with. They obviously not only represent a variety of different skill sets, uh, but also bring forth all of the work that they just described, helping to really build this department um, into an incredible team. Uh, and so I am very proud to work with them every day. And uh, it's been great to share a little bit about that with all of you here this evening. So thank you, Max. My pleasure and, and thank all of you again. Truly a remarkable group and a remarkable department. Uh, we uh, hope that you all stay safe and uh, wear a mask. Good night. Definitely. All. Thank you, Max. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Max.